Ken's a movie, he, he's a TV star. He really, have you seen him on Missing, Missing in Alaska? He's here tonight. But that's not all. <laughs> we found him! There he is. <laughs> or, or as Nick said, Alaska? Alaska? Did you hear him say that? I know it's called that. Anyway, Ken's hat has also appeared on lots of other shows. It's appeared on Monster Quest, Ancient Aliens, Travel Channel, Animal Planet, Sci-Fi, and National Geographic Channel. And when you book the hat, you get Ken thrown in. Wow. <laughs> it's pretty nice. He's got, he's an author and co, and uh, he's got a lot of books out here, so how about a big hand for Mr. Ken Gerhardt? Thank you, brother. Thanks, brother. I'm get right on mic. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Just thought I would uh, tantalize you here with kind of a rapid fire of topics that will be in my new book. Uh, it's going to be published by Llewellyn, and it's called A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts, uh, Encounters with Cryptid Creatures. And um, uh, I have a very diverse interest in cryptozoology, of course. Um, in addition to Bigfoot and Sasquatch, I've investigated Thunderbirds and Lake Monsters and werewolves and black panthers and all types of interesting creatures so i'm going to be writing about a kind of a diverse array of topics for this book uh, it includes a number of eyewitness accounts that have never b before been published um, one of the real benefits of you know having the opportunity to be on tv and stuff is that uh, people do get in touch with me and um, relate their encounters uh, some of them, regrettably, I uh, you know wish they hadn't gotten in touch with me because I, I get the sense that maybe the encounters didn't actually happen. But um, those are usually pretty easy to uh, kind of file away, and so uh, many of them though are left um, pretty remarkable uh, experiences. So I'm um, just going to kind of run through the list here, and um, if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll be happy to to open up the floor for a few questions. So chapter one is going to be about the, the Minnesota Iceman. Can I get a show of hands? Has, everybody, has anyone ever heard, heard of the Minnesota Iceman? It's a pretty famous, well, there you go. Yep, absolutely. The Minnesota Iceman, um, for me personally, it uh, had a, quite an impact on me. When I was first getting into Bigfoot, um, when I was about eight or nine years old, this was back in 1976. Of course, I was watching shows like In Search Of and Legend of Boggy Creek and all those, those good programs. Six Million Dollar Man, of course. Um, but um, I grew up in Minnesota, and um, at the Minnesota State Fair in 1976, I saw an exhibit called the Minnesota Iceman, and there was a guy out there calling out, is it man or beast? Is it a prehistoric caveman? Is it Bigfoot? And of course, I had to go in and check it out, and he had this thing frozen in a block of ice, and it was in a glass coffin. You couldn't see it too well because the, the ice was kind of opaque, but um, it was like a big, hairy, man-like creature. And um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the, the story, the Minnesota Iceman first went on display in 1967. A gentleman named Frank Hansen was touring around the United States displaying this thing. Um, and subsequently, word got back to the godfathers of cryptozoology, Bernard Hoovelmans and Ivan Sanderson. And they actually drove out to his property in uh, 1968, uh, November of 1968, and examined this thing for three days. And um, he asked them not to publish any of their findings, but they became convinced after three days of looking at this. And of course, they couldn't touch it because it was still frozen in ice. Uh, they took a number of measurements and photographs, and uh, they claimed they could actually smell the decaying flesh coming up through the ice. And you could see actually like bubbles forming in the ice and, and cracks in the ice. So they were convinced that whatever this thing was, it was real. And they didn't know. Uh, Hoovelman's later declared, wrote a scientific paper stating that he thought it was a surviving Neanderthal man. Ivan Sanderson didn't agree with that, but he knew that it, he thought that it was an actual flesh and blood creature. And um, prior to Sanderson and Hoovelman's looking at it, the thing had originally been found by a veterinary student named Terry Cullen, and apparently was also seen by some other gentlemen with scientific credentials. Um, now, once word got out about this Minnesota Iceman, Frank Hansen allegedly became uncomfortable because he was contacted by the FBI and other law enforcement officials asking him why he had a, a man-like man body frozen in a block of ice that apparently also had two gunshot wounds. You could clearly see those. The eye was blown out and there was a gunshot wound in the wrist. So Hansen uh, disappeared for a few months and then he resurfaced claiming that he had put the original Minnesota Iceman into hiding and he now had a latex duplicate that he was going to tour with. 
and uh, Hovelmans and Sanderson sent out some spies to visit the new exhibit and they were able to discern a number of differences between the new Minnesota Iceman and the original that they had observed. So they, they were still steadfast that, that it was a real specimen. Now, a lot of people think it was a fabulous hoax and that Hansen was just trying to make money. And um, so it's a pretty interesting story. It involves um, some big names like um, former Vice President Walter Mondale, um, film great Jimmy Stewart. And uh, it's got a lot of interesting twists and turns. But um, most recently, the Minnesota Iceman has been on exhibit in Austin, in Austin, Texas, at a place called Museum of the Weird down on uh, 6th Street. And this is Steve Boosty. He actually saw the, the Minnesota Iceman uh, display go up on eBay uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, like me, he saw it when he was a kid and it had a huge impact on him. So he bought the, the display. Now it's currently on loan to Lauren Coleman at the uh, International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine, but it should be returning to Austin in about a year. So you can actually go and see the exhibit yourself, and um, you know this could be uh, the latex duplicate of the Minnesota Iceman. Um, I, I don't want to uh, kind of give it away because it, it's kind of a surprise, but the fact that it's still in a pretty good shape after you know however many decades, I, I, I wouldn't think that what Steve has on display is necessarily flesh and blood, but. You know, it's, it's one of those great mysteries in the field of Bigfoot, but uh, nobody knows if there was an original Bigfoot, or I'm sorry, an original Minnesota Iceman, nobody knows exactly what happened to the remains, because Frank Hansen took that secret to his grave. He passed away in 2004, and his family subsequently sold off the, the display. I think they were kind of embarrassed about the whole affair, so um, potentially there could be a a skeleton or the remains of some type of unidentified hominid out there that was either buried or hidden by Hansen, who knows. But it's a pretty, pretty fascinating story. Um, I also do a chapter of, called Man Beasts in the Americas where I talk about um, Bigfoot types of creatures, uh, mystery hominids now. I try to put a kind of a different spin on, on my particular chapter since there are a lot of good books about Bigfoot out there already. One of the things I write about are my investigations in Central America. And in 2004 and 2006, I traveled down to the Central American nation of Belize and investigated two types of uh, creatures. One is known as the Sisamite. The Sisamite, the descriptions are identical to the North American Sasquatch, a big, hulking, hairy, man-like creature standing about seven feet tall very ape-like. And then there's a second smaller creature, um, and by the way, this uh, particular expedition was uh, endorsed by Chester Moore, who's another speaker here. He was uh, uh, formed the American Primate Conservation Alliance back in 2004, early 2000s, and he kind of endorsed me and supported me on this expedition, on both expeditions, which was pretty cool. The second uh, mystery hominin that's reported from the nation of Belize, and I guess you could describe these guys as Littlefoot because uh, the descriptions are basically similar to Bigfoot in terms of a, a bipedal, uh, man-like creature covered in hair, but standing only three to five feet tall. So in description, these are very similar to the Orang Pendek of uh, Sumatra, you've probably heard of, and other diminutive man-like creatures that have been reported around the world from Africa, Asia, uh, pretty much all over. Um, but uh, the natives are adamant that the Duende, now Duende in Belizean culture, or some people view these beings as kind of um, almost like uh, leprechauns or the, the little people, the, the folklore from around the world as having magical abilities. Um, but Ivan Sanderson, um, who lived in Central America for many years after World War II, claimed that he spoke to some forestry officials who actually saw these little creatures. And more recently, the famous zoologist Alan Rabinowitz, who formed the, uh, founded the Coxcomb Jaguar Sanctuary down in Belize, he claims that he saw a small, hairy man-like creature at the edge of some woods, uh, some jungle area down there in Belize. So, um, didn't find a lot of evidence. I found some ambiguous human-shaped tracks that were very small. Um, but they, you know, were not definitive enough to uh, really conclude anything. But um, pretty cool that we have uh, apparently uh, a subspecies of Bigfoot that's much smaller 
And these are not juveniles. A lot of people ask me, well, could they just be juvenile Bigfoots? Because they're often seen in pairs or in small groups. Now, in 2009, I did a television show for the History Channel called The Real Wolfman, and they sent me over to uh, France to investigate a very famous legend known as the Beast of Gévaudan. And uh, this is the closest thing you'll ever hear uh, to a real werewolf story. Back in the 1760s in southern France, this is in a very mountainous, remote area of southern France, uh, people began to get attacked and killed by a creature that was described as being about the size of a small calf, uh, wolf-like in appearance, um, with reddish fur, gigantic teeth, small pointy ears, and a long tail. And this was the Beast of Gévaudan. Um, it's a very complex mystery. A lot of people have you know, claimed that it was basically a case of mass hysteria where people were being attacked by wolves. Um, but King Louis the Fifteenth of France, he actually sent soldiers uh, garrisons of soldiers and professional wolf hunters to the Gévaudan region because uh, the hysteria in France reached such a fervor that it was creating a lot of instability. Um, and eventually a gentleman named Jean Chastel, who was a, a, a cast out, uh, a hunter, he shot a creature with a silver bullet, and this is, believe it or not, that's where we get the notion, Hollywood gets the notion that you need silver bullets to kill a werewolf. He shot this creature with a silver bullet, and um, the remains were subsequently taken to Paris while they were paraded around France for a couple of weeks. And then by the time they were really smelly and rotten and nasty, they were taken to King Louis. And he immediately just said, get rid of that thing. So there's a mystery to this day as far as what this creature was. But it was basically characterized as a werewolf. It attacked at least 100 people in France, uh, killed as many as 60 people. Uh, most of the victims were uh, women and children who were off uh, herding uh, cattle and sheep in remote areas. And strangely, the creature never actually attacked the livestock, only the people. And the, the, the murders were quite uh, vicious. The remains were eviscerated, oftentimes decapitated, disemboweled, and so forth. So, pretty fascinating story. Um, I do have some DVD copies of The Real Wolfman for sale if you're interested in werewolves and um, uh, you want to learn more about what we, what we found on our investigation. Uh, now, of course, many of you that are interested in cryptozoology are familiar with black panthers. Black panthers have been reported giant black cats, uh, similar to giant black jaguars or leopards, have been reported throughout the British Isles and also here in North America. Now, science does not acknowledge that there is a melanistic or black phase of the American mountain lion, Puma concolor. We know there are some mountain lions in places they shouldn't be in the eastern United States, but as far as a uh, all mountain lions are known to be kind of a tawny or brown or tan color. There's never been an example of a completely black mountain lion. So one of the theories is there could be a melanistic phase or morph of the American mountain lion. Uh, another theory is that there could be actually escaped black leopards and black jaguars. Um, exotic cat collectors, for whatever reason, will collect leopards and, and jaguars, and sometimes they do escape and get into the wild. Or perhaps people are misidentifying you know, large black house cats or uh, black bobcats and things like that. But um, in 2012, I was invited by Scott Marlowe from the Pangea Institute in Florida, invited me and my uh, colleague, Lee Hales, who's a naturalist, to Carabelle, uh, Florida, where there have been many sightings of something known as the Carabelle cat, which is described as a huge black panther. And uh, the, the city council of Carabelle actually, uh, you know, formerly invited us to form an expedition. So to my knowledge, this may be one of the few examples of a United States government entity actually inviting a cryptozoological expedition to try to find answers as to what this Carabelle cat was. Um, there's a vast area of wilderness. This is up in the Florida Panhandle, and there's an area known as uh, Tate's Hell National Forest. Isn't that a great name for a, for a place for a cryptid to hide? So we went up there in 2012 and mounted an expedition we were besieged by pretty bad weather. There was a videotape that had allegedly been shot by a hunter in a deer blind. And we met and interviewed with this gentleman and he was convinced that he had filmed this Carabelle cat. He said this thing was much larger than a house cat. Um, he thought at first that it was a Jagarundi, which is kind of a strange looking cat with a small head and a long tail that is uh, potentially native to, to parts of, of 
the United States, southern United States, though that's controversial. So one of the experiments we did was I actually I uh, made a black uh, cardboard cutout of a, about the size and dimensions of a small Florida panther. There is a native indigenous species, uh, group of, of panthers in southern Florida, mostly in the Everglades. And so one of our theories was, well, maybe this, uh, this carabelle cat could be a, a melanistic phase of a American mountain lion, Pumacan color. So we, we cut out this cardboard piece and we were able to find the exact location where the gentleman uh, filmed his cat. And my colleague Lee climbed up into the tree, into the uh, deer blind and took a photograph of the thing. And then we did a comparative thing with his videotape. And subsequently, uh, I was able to get the assistance of a professional surveyor who, using his software, was able to determine that the cat the gentleman filmed was 14 inches tall at the shoulders. So basically what he did film was a black house cat. And we kind of already thought that because if you look at the posturing of the tail, domestic cats will usually walk with their tail kind of upright in the air, whereas uh, mountain lions and other feral and wild cats will typically have their tail flat in the back. So. Um, needless to say, the gentleman wasn't too happy about our findings and we were almost unceremoniously run out of Carabelle after they had invited us down there. Um, but you know, just because we debunked this videotape doesn't mean that, because we interviewed many witnesses and we looked at the habitat, we didn't find any um, sign of big cats, but we did find a lot of bear sign out there. So it's a pretty vast and remote wilderness area and um, so the potential for a, a you know, some type of cryptid cat out there is, I think, pretty great. Um, was this last year? 2000, yeah, this was 2014. Um, I was invited down to Mexico for a, a series called The Unexplained Files. This is for the Science Channel. And this was to investigate the Mexican chupacabra. Um, there had been a series in the uh, in, uh, Puebla state, which is south of Mexico City, there had been a series of livestock killings in September of 2011. Up to 300 goats were killed in a period of a few days, a hundred at a time. So these goat farmers would come out in the morning and find a hundred of their goats completely dead in the pen. And according to the farmers and ranchers, these goats had mysterious puncture wounds in the neck and the bodies were completely bloodless. So the name Chupacabra, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with, the, the vampire-like Chupacabra of Latin America was mentioned. So I went down and staged an investigation, and uh, you can see it's a pretty vast and remote uh, kind of desert area, terrain. This is a photograph of one of the uh, dead goats that was killed, um, and as you can see, there is a little bit of blood present, and it, you know, there were a number of photographs that were shown to me, and um, contrary to what I was told about there only being puncture wounds in the neck, there were a number of wounds on these animals. There were flaps of skin hanging loose on the side, there were wounds on the back, on the face. And so, subsequently, um, my determination was that these goats had actually been killed by a mountain lion. And um, this is a pretty rare situation, but there have been documented cases where American mountain lions, again, Puma Concolor, have gotten into goat and sheep pens and basically gone on killing sprees. And this is an instinct, uh, instinctive action. It's, it's an exceptional behavior pattern. It's not, they're not killing to eat. They're not eating the remains. They ascend, it's very similar to the, those of you who have house cats. It's kind of when your house cat finds a mouse or a lizard and just you know, kills the thing just for the you know, sheer joy of killing. It's their instinct. So I was able to determine that there were ways that these mountain lions could have gotten in and out of these uh, pens and killed these goats. Um, of course, mountain lions are indigenous, are endemic to most of North and South America. They're the most widespread and successful predator, and they're rarely ever seen because they're very stealthy animals. Um, for this particular episode, we were also shown what was presented to us as a dead chupacabra in a jar, like an infant. We debunked that as a deformed goat. And, um, but you know, I'm, I'm not completely ruling out the possibility that there might not be some vampire-like predator out there that's unknown to science. Um, but, you know, I have done a number of investigations down in Mexico and obviously it's a very traditional culture and the people are very superstitious. And so oftentimes when something exceptional happens, they will uh, come up with a sort of a supernatural explanation for it. So, okay, so I also have a chapter in the book about um, sea monsters and aquatic cryptids. Um, 
there are, um, obviously there have been accounts of, of sea serpents and serpent-like creatures all over the world's oceans, mostly in the North Atlantic for centuries, and of course many of the lakes of the, uh, you know, in a particular latitudinal region, Loch Ness, Lake Champlain. Uh, my colleague John Kirk, I think, is going to be doing an excellent presentation later about uh, one particular uh, sea, quote-unquote sea serpent. Um, I did collect an account from a woman named Jenny Tyson up in Nova Scotia, and she got in touch with me after she had been walking out on the beach one day. She liked to go out there and take strolls on the beach, and she claims that she saw an animal that had kind of uh, beached itself, more or less, on the rocks, and as she watched it, it was able to free itself, and she described it as a 20-foot-long harbor seal. Well, if you guys know anything about harbor seals, which are very common in, uh, off the coast of Nova Scotia, the largest known harbor seal only has a, a length of about five or six feet. The only seals in the world that are uh, 20 feet long are the elephant seals of the southern hemisphere, which are not known to be native to uh, the waters off of Nova Scotia. Um, one of the theories about the, the, sea, the sea serpents that have been sighted through centuries was that they are actually pinnipeds. That is, they are related to seals and sea lions and that they've developed a uh, basically, there's an evolved species that has a very long neck and a small head. This was first proposed by uh, Anton uh, Udemans uh, back in the 1800s, and then later Bernard Huhlmans and other people mentioned that um, pinnipeds could be responsible for some of the sightings. There's many theories. Many people are familiar with the plesiosaur theory. Um, archaic whales known as zooglodons have also been mentioned as possible candidates for sea serpents. Um, I did an expedition uh, back in 2012. I joined up with some other researchers and we went and investigated a lake monster in um, Pennsylvania. And this is known as Raystown Ray. If any of you are from Pennsylvania, you've probably heard of Raystown Lake. It's a man-made lake, a kind of a reservoir that's uh, been around since the 1970s. And people describe uh, Ray as about a 15-foot-long serpentine animal. So. Um, of course, there I am in the front. Next to me is Philip Abernathy, who is a crypto enthusiast and paleontologist fossil hunter from New Jersey. Next to him is Bill Houlihan, who's an expert scuba diver and treasure hunter. And on the far side down there is Cheska Burleson, who's a marine biologist from Florida. So the four of us joined forces, went up to Raystown Lake and in, uh, mounted an investigation for several days. Um, we didn't find any evidence. And after interviewing many of the eyewitnesses, uh, and moreover, after going to the local gift shop and seeing how the town has really profited from Raystown Ray, I mean, literally, it's, uh, it's, it's turned into kind of a Loch Ness scenario where they've got t-shirts and photographs and postcards. They're very proud of Raystown Ray. Um, I do believe that there is a, an unknown species of animal that is, uh, can be connected to all of the sea serpent and lake monster reports worldwide. Um, I don't know if Raystown Lake in Pennsylvania is the best location to find said animal. Like I said, it's pretty much a man-made reservoir. It's only been around since the 1970s. It's the biggest lake entirely within the state of Pennsylvania, but it's still not a, you know, as big as, as Lake Champlain or some of the other monster lakes around the world. Now, um, for my series Missing in Alaska, we investigated the Lake Iliamna monster up in Alaska. Uh, lake Iliamna is like the eighth largest lake in the world. It's a, a massive lake in southwest Alaska, and it's very, very remote with a very small population base. Sightings of the Lake Iliamna monster, which is known by the native name of Jigignak, um, date back literally, you know, centuries and you know even decades as far as um, Western anglers and fishermen. People have claimed to have seen these animals where they're flying over the lake in float planes and helicopters. The most pragmatic theory to explain the Lake Iliamna monster is that um, they are giant lake sturgeon because many of the witness accounts, unlike the Loch Ness monster, Ogopogo, Champlain monster, some of the other lake monsters around the world, people that have flown over these things in the water say that they have the silhouettes of giant fish. They can clearly see that they have a vertical tail swaying back and forth, a blunt head, um, prominent um, pectoral fins and so forth. So uh, this is a picture of a, of a Russian uh, sturgeon. Um, the largest known sturgeon on record was 24 feet long and weighed over 3,000 pounds. It was caught in Russia's Volga River back in the 19, uh, 1820s, I'm sorry. 
But there have been sturgeon sighted in North America on a regular basis that are 11 or 12 feet long in the rivers of Oregon and so forth. Now, sturgeon has never been, there's only one sturgeon that's ever been caught in Lake Iliamna, and it was a very small juvenile specimen. So there's not a lot of evidence that sturgeon are, uh, but they do live in the ocean, um, travel into rivers and fresh water, very similar to salmon. So um, that, that particular episode will be coming up um, hopefully in the next month or so. Okay, so one of the main focuses of my research through the years has been thunderbirds. Now, thunderbirds, of course, is a Native American uh, derived from many Native American cultures. Many, many Native American cultures have legends of these enormous birds, super eagles, that can block out the sun. And because I've written books on the subject and done a number of TV shows and interviews, I am constantly contacted by people that have had sightings of thunderbirds. And, um, you know, I'll typically mount it. I, I'm not always able to do an on-site investigation, but I'll typically interview the person a couple of times, get to know them, get as much information as I can. And um, these folks are typically very credible. Now, it must be pointed out that some descriptions of thunderbirds, which are typically reported as having a wingspan from 12 to 15 to 20 feet across, about five times larger than any known species of, of raptor in North America, much larger than a condor, an eagle, and so forth. Um, people, I think, that have seen thunderbirds, sometimes these can be misidentifications. There are cases, of course, where people see these things up in the air and it's very hard to judge the distance and the size of something that's flying kind of high up in the air. Um, but there have been other sightings where people have seen these things actually land on uh, you know, their rooftops or large branches of trees in their yard and so forth. And many of the people that I've interviewed that have seen these thunderbirds are people that are very experienced at observing wildlife, people that work in the outdoors, have been around birds. Um, so. Uh, there are a couple of inter uh, interesting theories about what these thunderbirds could be. Uh, one is that these could be actually um, known species like golden eagles and uh, condors that perhaps uh, some of these in some cases may have uh, a genetic condition called gigantism. And of course gigantism uh, appears in all different species and uh, sometimes you have these exceptional in individuals of, of different species. Um, another possibility is that we could be dealing with something known as Washington's Eagle. Uh, the great naturalist and artist John James Audubon in the 1800s claimed that he observed and ultimately shot a species of eagle with a 10-foot wingspan uh, that was not a bald eagle or golden eagle. And modern ornithologists dispute this claim because no one's ever found another example of this Washington's Eagle, but it is possible since Audubon uh, obviously described many, many species of birds that are accepted today. And the third theory is that we could have something known as teratorns still alive. Teratorns were giant birds that lived uh, throughout the Americas up until the end of the Ice Age, the Pleistocene epoch, about 11 or 12,000 years ago. And uh, one species in North America had a wingspan that was about 18 feet across. It was known as Aeolornis. Its fossils have been found mostly in California and the La Brea Tar Pits, Nevada, Oregon. Um, there have been fossils found, I believe, also in Florida. So there is a possibility that these giant uh, birds, which were actually sort of related to modern vultures and condors, but moreover, they were kind of like giant storks. Um, but again, these birds had enormous wingspans. Um, some of the hot spots or areas where I get a lot of reports are here in Texas, uh, the state of Illinois, for some strange reason, uh, Pennsylvania, north central Pennsylvania in the Black Mountains, and very recently, a lot of sightings from Alaska and the Rocky Mountains, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and places like that, uh, which makes a lot of sense from a biological standpoint because uh, a large raptor like this would probably benefit from the air currents and updrafts of high elevations. So you would certainly expect to find a bird like this in a place like Alaska or the Rocky Mountains. Uh, it is kind of uh, befuddling that we get so many accounts from places like Illinois and some other places in the Midwest, but. Uh, again, many eyewitness accounts that have never before been published are going to be featured in my book. Uh oh. Okay, so I also have a chapter called Dragons in Modern Times. And um, this is me um, at age 15 in Switzerland. Of course, you got the Matterhorn there behind me. 
And I had a very remarkable upbringing. And when I was growing up, I had the opportunity to travel all over the world with my mother. And wherever we went, I was always very interested and keen in the uh, mysterious creatures and legendary beasts of wherever we were. And when we were in Switzerland, trekking through the Alps, I heard about this creature known as the Totselverm. And the Totselverm is a, kind of a, like a veritable dragon. It's been described from the Swiss and Austrian Bavarian Alps. And it's also known as the spring worm. Uh, it's described as about, it's not a very large animal. It's described as about three to five feet tall with a worm-like body, uh, front limbs, but not rear limbs. Some people have described its head as looking like a cat's head, which is kind of strange. And the uh, Totselverm is said to basically hide in little caves and to spring out or jump out at people when they walk by. Uh, there are not a lot of my modern sightings on uh, record that I'm aware of. There are many accounts from the 1920s, and actually the Totsa worm uh, appeared in different hunting guides uh, from the 19th century. So it was an accepted animal back then. So it's, it's kind of like a dragon-like creature, I suppose. Many people have proposed a reptilian identity, or perhaps some type of large amphibian, something like that. So not a true worm, but uh, maybe like a legless lizard, something like that. There's a kind of an artist interpretation of, of a topsail worm there. Nope. I keep jumping ahead here, sorry about that. Um, I talked about, for those of you that were there last night, I talked about accounts of living dinosaurs. Um, fleeting and far between and highly improbable, I'll be the first one to acknowledge that, but um, throughout the American Southwest, here in Texas and places in Colorado, there have been accounts of these so-called river dinos, which are described as about man-sized bipedal lizards with very long, thin necks, small heads, and long tails. So uh, I've got some accounts of those in the book. Very recently, there were uh, a handful of sightings from southern Texas, Hebronville, and Falfurius. Uh, there is a possibility that people could be misidentifying, perhaps, large lizards that are running on their hind legs. There is a, a a species of lizard known as the mountain boomer that's indigenous to Texas and Oklahoma. And when these things get going, they run on their hind legs. Now, they're only about 14 inches long, so. This is an eyewitness sketch of uh, what a gentleman claims was a pterosaur, a pterodactyl, that flew over his house over San Antonio, Texas, back in 2013. Um, he got a really good look at this thing. Um, what's interesting is that the wings uh, really, the wings that he sketched are more like bat-like wings. If you know anything about the morphology of the pterodactyl or the pterosaur wing, it's basically a, a, the, the fifth finger on their hand has been elongated and there's a single membranous flap of skin that kind of folds out. But um, I, I continue to get or collect accounts of living pterosaurs all over North America. Um, again, highly improbable that they exist, but so many people that I've interviewed are adamant that that, that is definitely what they've seen as a flying reptile and not a bird, so. Kind of a modern dragon, I suppose. Giant amphibians, this is a real interest of mine. Um, this is a, a sketch of potentially what the Loch Ness Monster could look like. Now, the predominant theory is if the Loch Ness Monster even exists, because many people feel that it's, it's probably uh, a series of hoaxes and misidentifications, the common theories or identities that have been linked with the Loch Ness Monster are a plesiosaur, which of course is an archa archaic marine reptile, um, a giant seal or pentapod, a long-necked seal like we were talking about earlier, a, an archaic whale, uh, and even perhaps a giant invertebrate or sea slug. But one of the original theories about the Loch Ness Monster, uh, which I kind of revisit for the book, is the possibility that the Loch Ness Monster is a giant amphibian, perhaps some type of aquatic salamander or newt. So let's talk about the, uh, what we have in favor of this potential theory. Um, unlike reptiles, amphibians are very comfortable in cold water. And one of the big arguments against plesiosaurs, and we don't know if plesiosaurs were warm or cold-blooded, but uh, the largest species of salamanders in the world, uh, the Chinese and Japanese salamanders, uh, live in cold, very cold water, cold water mountain streams. Um, so amphibians, their metabolism is actually well suited for cold water environments. Furthermore, amphibians, because they oftentimes will absorb oxygen through their skin from the water, do not need to come to the surface very often. So potentially a giant salamander or newt could stay comfortably hidden in the depths of Loch Ness, only surfacing on rare occasions. Moreover, in prehistoric times, 
for example, back during the Carboniferous period, about 300 million years ago, there were amphibians that were a good size, at least 15 feet long in the case of Eurogynus. So it's not, you know, I don't think it's inconceivable that this could be one potential explanation for the Loch Ness Monster and other lake monsters around the world is that we could be dealing with rarely seen, essentially a giant salamander or a giant aquatic newt about 15 feet in length. So I talk about that in the book. Uh, accounts of giant frogs and toads, uh, not too common, but there are, you know, of course the giant, the largest frogs we know of, like the Goliath frogs from Africa are pretty scary if you see them up close, but not certainly not man-sized. But here in North America, we have accounts of the Loveland frog. Uh, there's something known as the Coleman frog, which is kind of a taxidermy stuffed frog up in uh, Canada that people have claimed was real. Um, and moreover, um, in 2008, I traveled up to Massachusetts and investigated sightings of a dog-sized frog in Silver Lake, Massachusetts. And I did not find any evidence, um, nor did I find anyone in the area that would corroborate that there was a dog-sized or man-sized frog in Lake Silver Lake. Uh, and then I also have a chapter called Creepy Crawlies. And for those of you that hate spiders, I have good news for you. Or maybe not. There's a... Uh, a fireman, an emergency worker from Georgia that contacted me uh, and told me that he saw a, he's convinced that he saw a spider as large as a house cat running up a tree in his backyard. So I've interviewed this gentleman several times. Um, there are obviously, there's no evidence that house cat sized spiders could exist in North America. Um, but this gentleman is about as credible as they come. And uh, throughout my course of my research for the book, of course, there have been accounts of huge spiders in places where you'd expect to find them, like the African Congo and uh, South America and the Amazon, New Guinea. Uh, but North American spiders, not so much, but I did scrape up a few accounts, including one account from Louisiana of a uh, spider the size of a large wash bucket. And then, of course, we have accounts of giant centipedes, mostly from the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas and Missouri. Uh, this is the uh, Scolopendra heros, which of course is the Texas red-headed centipede. The accepted length for this animal is uh, 8 inches, but there have been many accounts of centipedes 12 to 18 inches long that have been found in the Ozarks of Arkansas and Missouri. So, uh, I'm giving you guys the heebie-jeebies, aren't I? And then the last chapter in the book, I explore some more whimsical creatures like accounts of mermaids, which uh, uh, admittedly I'm not a proponent of. Uh, being a viable possibility. Uh, but it's interesting that we do have these accounts around the world of these kind of mirror beings. And also um, their avian counterparts, the flying humanoids. And this is an eyewitness sketch from a gentleman uh, up in Big Spring, Texas named Trey Austin, uh, who swears to me that he and his wife watched a nine foot tall, long haired, winged humanoid creature fly over their directly over their heads one evening uh, back in 2012. So I do have uh, copies of my Encounters with Flying Humanoids book here as well, which of course cover other whimsical accounts of flying humanoid type of creatures. So, uh, so there you go. It's a little kind of a, a appetizer platter, if you will, a little sampler of uh, some of the topics that will be covered in my new book, A Menagerie of Mysterious Beasts, which will be out next year. And I'm assuming I'm out of time, so if you've got any questions, come talk to me. And I'll be doing a lecture later today as well. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Keep it going for Ken Gerhardt's hat.